Back here on Busted Open, Dave LaGreca, Bully Ray. And as we said at the top of the show, Bully, we lost a legend, and that was King Kong Bundy, one of the greatest heels, not only in the WWF, but in the history of pro wrestling. And his first manager in the WWF, his manager at his side for the first ever WrestleMania, our guest right now, Jimmy, mouth of the South Heart. Jimmy, how are you, my friend? Good morning, guys. You know, kind of a sad morning, but, man, it seems like every month we lose somebody. A, what, a few months ago, I lost Jim the Anvil Nightheart, and it just seems like it just continues on and on. Jimmy, we were just saying before you came on, like, everybody that passes away, it seems like you knew really well. You crossed paths with them, right? Well, I, in Memphis, Tennessee, I had King Kong Bundy in Memphis. I had Jim Neidhart in Memphis. I even had Rick Rude in Memphis, you know, back then. And, and of course, uh, just it just seemed like tragedy. It surrounds Jimmy Hart in a certain way. But uh, but I was just looking at the list of WrestleMania 1. You know, when I had uh, the first match we had with Bundy was in Poughkeepsie, New York. It was on March, I believe, the 16th, 1985. And then, of course, on the 31st of March, 1985, was the first WrestleMania, which I managed him there. But I made a list. I would just want to run through it real, for the first WrestleMania. King Kong Pundy's passed away, Jimmy Snuka, Captain Lou, Ali, Bruno San Martino, Johnny Valiant, Rowdy Roddy Piper, S.D. Jones. You know, a Buddy Rose was the executioner. He's gone. Matt Bourne's gone. J.Y.D.'s gone. Uh, Nikolai Volkov, Fred Blassie, Bobby Heenan, John Studd, Andre the Giant, and the fabulous Moolah. That's unbelievable. Wow. All wow. from WrestleMania 1. Yep, it's crazy, isn't it? It, it, it really is. Uh, Jimmy, you mentioned that you had you had worked with Bundy prior to when he had gotten to the WWF. Um, when he got to the WWF, did Vince put him with you immediately, or did you ask to be put with him? How did that relationship come to be in the WWF? Well, I was so happy to be in the WWF from Memphis. I love Memphis, by the way, but, you know, when I went up there, that whoever they wanted to put me with, I didn't mind. I didn't mind going out three or four times a night. Some of the other managers, um, I remember a meeting one time, and it was me, Captain Lou, who I love, and Fred Blassie, who I loved, and Fuji, and all of them got together, and they said, Jimmy, you're going out three or four times a night. You've got five or six guys to manage. He goes... You know what? He said, before you know it, oh, your heat's going to be going. You get beat up every night. You'll only be here three or four months. And I said, well, that would be the greatest three months I've ever had. But in Memphis, I was used to doing that every night. But now, looking back on it, now when you watch, like you just said, when you watch uh, a lot of the legend stuff on the on the um, WWE Network, I'm on most of those tapes because I didn't mind going out three or four times a night, you know. And I wasn't thinking about me lasting a long time or, or a short time up there or anything. It was just giving the people their money's worth, and I love doing it. You know, we look back, I mean, unbelievable. Like you said, that you know, it's 1985, that, that first WrestleMania and all those legends that have, have passed. It's crazy. And King Kong Bundy somebody who kind of stepped away from the WWF at, at a very early age. I mean, he came back and he was kind of in semi-retirement, but he was one of the biggest heels and he stepped away. Did you know early on that King Kong Bundy was somebody that, hey, I'm going to do this for a short time, but this isn't everything that I have in life? Well, when we first started together, you know, we traveled a lot together back then. And then, um, you know, I'd go to his house sometimes too, like during the holidays if we were up in North, cause I lived in Memphis back then. And, uh, I'd just stay with him at his house some and everything else after the first WrestleMania and stuff. So I got to know the family and them pretty well, but, uh, but Bundy was always so witty and so funny. Even back then he liked the comedy stuff. You know, even in the hotel rooms, when we stayed together in the hotel rooms sometimes, you know, he had always uh, kind of flipped to the TV what was on back then, and he loved watching the funny shows and the comedy stuff. I always thought he really wanted to be a comedian more than anything, but he was just naturally witty. But what a great heel. You're so right, especially in Memphis. I remember we were in a lawsuit in Memphis one time in Milan, Tennessee. I was managing a guy named Masio Ito from Japan. I had Phil Hickerson, who was uh, one of the local stars from that area down in Jackson. And I had, uh, you know, some of the other guys, too, but on that particular show, and Bundy. And a guy jumped out of the audience, and didn't he hurt me? He just kind of pushed me down. I slid across the, the high school gym floor, and out comes Bundy and all these guys to help me out. Well, the next day, we go to TV, and all of a sudden, Eddie Marlin goes, Jimmy, 
you and Masio Ito have got to go back to Milan, Tennessee to to put up a bond. I said, what for? He said, well, the guy's suing y'all for assault. I said, how did you touch the guy? And he goes, <laughs> well, they said you did. They said you were biting his nose and Bundy was squashing him, doing the five count on him and everything. And I went, what? So I had to go back up there to Milan. And I had to find the uh, fire department that was taking pictures and security. And they showed me that I was on the ring apron when the fight was going on, you know. And so we make a long story short, we won the lawsuit and everything, but it was crazy. We all thought we were going to be cleaning up trash up in Jackson, Tennessee and Milan, Tennessee for the next six months. You know, it's what they predicted. They had all the TV cameras there from Jackson, Tennessee, from Memphis, from Nashville. It was really big news back then, but we won this case. But Bundy was always great. Like I said before, what a heel, too. Jimmy, whose idea was it to do the five count? Uh, Vince's. Okay, so he wasn't doing the five count in Memphis then, correct? Oh, no, no, definitely not. But listen, everything that took place up there was Vince. You know, the megaphone. The reason I got the megaphone up there, Vince brought it back from Japan. I guess he saw somebody over there with one and said, this is going to be your new gimmick. Thank you very much. Lucky it wasn't a piano. Can't you imagine carrying a piano on the road everywhere? <laughs> oh, my God. But, but, uh, but uh, no, everything that took place and you know was uh, Vince's idea. One of the one of the stories that we hear over the years is uh, is about Andre, and I know you had a relationship with Andre, and how Andre didn't like some of the bigger guys. Did Andre have a good relationship with Bundy or not? Well, there was no, as far as I know, it's, when we were together, there was no really problem with Andre. I don't think he really cared for John Studd too much, you know, we knew that. But uh, but Andre was great. You know, when we'd go in the dressing room with Andre, I mean, think about my life. This was my office up there for 10 WrestleManias. I'd go in there, you got Andre playing cards with Arnold Scolan. Over to my right, you got the honky tonk man tuning his guitar. Then you got Jake over in one corner with Damian the Snake. You got the British Bulldogs feeding Matilda. You got Nikolai Volkov and the Iron Sheik rehearsing the Russian national anthem. And then you've got the Nasty Boys going over their match with the Rousseau brothers. And when they got to the ring, they forgot about everything they talked about. So that's how crazy <laughs> that was. But it's just the who's who of wrestling. I mean, oh my, I've been so blessed. I mean, it's been crazy. You know, you mentioned you mentioned Memphis, and that's when you first started working with King Kong Bundy. I just finished watching that documentary, Memphis Heat, which was absolutely fantastic. And you look at some of the wrestlers, like you mentioned, Bundy, Rick Rude, Jim Neidhart, Ox Baker, Eddie Gilbert. You know, there's so much talent that came from Memphis and got even bigger on the stage of the WWF. Yeah, Randy Savage was there too. Yep, I managed Randy, Randy for a while, and and and. Lanny Poffo and Angelo Poffo. So, uh, you know, it was just, it was such a cool place to be back then. We didn't know what we really had. Um, I was talking to Jerry Jarrett this, at, at WrestleMania when Jeff went in last year, but Jerry Jarrett was there and we were talking. He said, Jimmy, did you realize our ratings back then, which we didn't know about ratings back then that much, like seven out of every TV's in Memphis and Arkansas and Mississippi, that whole little area we're in, we're watching wrestling every Saturday morning uh, from 11 to 12.30. And then also it was doing like a 21 and 22 share. That's almost like uh, American Idol numbers now, you know, for that area, of yep. course. Crazy. J Jimmy, were you with uh, Bundy when he found out that he was going to main event WrestleMania 2 uh, against Hogan? What happened was we uh, I traded... I've got to be the dumbest manager in the world. Why would I trade King? I traded King Kong Bundy. Think about this to Bobby Heenan for Adrian Adonis, who was great. And Dino Bravo, who was very good too. So it was a really good trade, I guess. But, uh, Bundy goes, Jimmy, you should have got more money for me. You know, just joking. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, and so, uh, but Bundy was always great. You know, he, like I said, in the dress rooms, he was always telling jokes and, you know, and everything else, but he was just, um, I think he was very excited to, for the first WrestleMania. Both of us were excited to be coming from Memphis, Tennessee, and all of a sudden, here we are. I was kind of like, you know, when I left Memphis back with Jerry Lawler and them, the headlines in the Memphis paper when I left, and I remember Bundy telling me about this, too. He said uh, the headlines in the sports section said, Jimmy Hart leaving Memphis wrestling was like Barney Fife leaving Andy of Mayberry. So I thought that was a hell of a compliment <laughs> for Memphis. And Bundy, Bundy would always say that, hey, Barney, Barney Fife. And then he'd always rib me about that. He really would. You mentioned the first WrestleMania, and it's so odd 
that you think of the first WrestleMania, King Kong Bundy's opponent was SD Special Delivery Jones, and it was a match that was 23 seconds long, a, a record that held on for decades when it came to WrestleMania. Did you know for that first WrestleMania that it would become as big as it's become? You know what? I don't think anybody did. It was just kind of a, a crapshoot, and, of course, Vince put everything on the line for that. A lot of his agents and everybody tried to talk him out of it and said, you know, this will never work. You know, people going to movie theaters and watching wrestling, it's unheard of. This will never, oh, my gosh, you know, but he stuck to his guns, and thank God he did because now, what, WrestleMania 35 coming up uh, this year at MedLife Stadium, and um Look at 35 years later, and it's still every Monday and Tuesday night, you know, everything's still going strong. So it's just, you know, no matter who comes or goes, you know, it's just um, the gas tank is still full in the car, and it just keeps on rolling, man. Jimmy, does King Kong Bundy belong in the WWE Hall of Fame? Oh, my gosh, yes. You know, I was talking to somebody before. Here's what I wish. If, if I, I would like to see this. I think there should be, and I just me, me personally, I think there should have been a, a WCW part of the Hall of Fame and the people that were there mostly go in the WCW part because they have a, they have all the tapes in there. Should be an ECW Hall of Fame for them too to induct somebody each year from ECW uh, and of course WWF WWE of course uh, and then you know put the celebrity in that you want to put in. But I've always felt like that because I always thought that ECW was such a major part of what was happening back then because. Heyman and all the guys that were up there back in the day and whoever was in charge of all the writing and putting it together and everything, they took guys that were small and big and blonde and bald and tattoos and no tattoos. And I mean, oh my gosh, it's just, they, they it was just, to me, it was great. You know, we'd sneak and watch TV when we could, when I believe they were on Friday night on one of the stations and I, I loved it. I thought it was just very clever how they took people, a lot of them that nobody had ever heard of before and, and, People fell in love with these guys, and, and it's more more of that now than because you, you, you have a chance to really see it because since Vince has all the tapes and kind of releases a lot of that stuff, you have a chance to see a lot of stuff that we never got a chance to see before, you know, because we were on the road. Just listening to you praise ECW, and obviously the guy behind all that was Paul Heyman. Did you have a good relationship with Paul throughout the years? Well, you know what? Paul took one of my uh, first pictures that was in one of those, those yearbook type things those people put out. I call them a yearbook, but... I was down at um, uh, Honky Tonk Man and myself were down at one of the uh, local cafes down in um, uh, New York, and it was the one that I forget the name of it that had the uh, the little cars like car seats that you eat in, right? Hot rod cars. And he took the first pictures of it. Listen, I, me, I, I love Paul, Jimmy Cornette. Um, I mean, you know, Bobby Heenan, tremendous. All the managers that I had a chance to work with. I was just thinking the other day. I said I'm almost like the last man standing. Look at me. When I first went up to New York, there was Lou Albano. He's gone. Fred Blassie, God rest his soul, he's not there anymore. Mr. Fuji, uh, like I said, Heenan, Blassie, uh, Albano, Fuji, uh, just all those guys. Oh, um, God, who am I leaving? I'm leaving somebody else out. But um, but um, the ones that I started with, there's nobody but me anymore. Then Slick came later on, of course. But I'll, I'll do respect to Paul Heyman and and um, and. Jimmy Cornette and all those guys, but uh, every, when I watch Raw on Monday night, I always look forward when Brock Lesnar's out there. I love Brock, but so I could hear Heyman's interviews are still great. And Jimmy, we really appreciate the time, especially you know sharing some memories of King Kong Bundy. Hopefully, we get you on soon. You know, better times. You know, just to kind of reminisce about your Hall of Fame career because you obviously an inductee in 2005 for the WWE Hall of Fame. We'd love to get you back on under better circumstances, but thank you sharing some memories of King Kong Bundy. We appreciate well, it. We, we love you too, guys. Thank you. We love you. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate you. Thank, thank you. you, Jimmy. Take care, brother. All right. Thank All right, you. Baby, thank you.